morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see you all here with us today. Uh, the theme kind of governing our service on this ninth Sunday after Trinity is it's a, a theme of comfort, really, I guess if I had to put a word to it. Um, the Lord calls us today to, to look away from the, the things that cause us fear, from the things that, that annoy us or stress us, and to look solely to Him for comfort. He reminds us in our texts that He has called us by the gospel. He's called us His very own, and it's our standing in His kingdom solely by His grace which is our source of comfort. So may we, we find comfort in these readings today and, and turn away from, our, from all the things which, which are bothering us lately and focus on God's word. We begin our service with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather in your presence to hear your holy word. Grant that through the hearing of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins, to believe in Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for your name's sake. Amen. Begin with our opening hymn, hymn 19, verses 1, 3, and 4, and you can find it printed in the bulletin. Beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness, our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. We read responsibly from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. verse of the day comes from our sermon text, Psalm 56, verses 10 and 11. Alleluia! In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Alleluia! Lord, Foundation in Christ rather than any foundation in themselves. 
And so he's doing here with young Pastor Timothy. He tells him, remember your calling. It wasn't that Timothy was overly qualified or anything like that to be a pastor, but simply because God had called him. Here we sit in church, not because we're, we're better than anyone else, or because we're, we're holy, or we, we're, we're righteous in any part of ourselves, but simply because God has called us with a holy calling through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so today, we focus on that calling, realizing that God has chosen us, and that's something in which we can always rejoice. <clears throat> I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into, the, into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Here ends God's holy word according to the epistle lesson. Our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 32 through 40. God tells us that in this age of fear, we don't have anything to be afraid of. Because God has chosen us to give us his kingdom of righteousness and his kingdom of heaven. This is a wonderful thing. No matter what the world does to us, we know that we have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so even as, God, as Jesus talks here that judgment day is coming up, even at an hour that we do not know, and we, we're never going to be able to just expect it to come, yet we don't have anything to be afraid of then because we know that we have been bought with the precious blood of Christ Jesus. We already know that on Judgment Day, God will look at us and, and tell us to enter into his rest. And so in the meantime, it's important that we focus on the one thing needful. There are a lot of things which call for our attention, a lot of things which, which get us worried and stressed and cause many tears and anxieties, yet the Lord calls us to focus just on the one thing, him and his word and the salvation we have in Christ Jesus, then we are totally ready at any time for Christ to come. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Here ends God's holy word. I would now invite the congregation to rise as we join in confessing our Christian faith following the sound words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe.
believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the next hymn. mercy and everlasting peace be to each one of you from God our Father and from your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. The text that I will lay upon your hearts this morning is the 56th Psalm. To the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a miktam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause, all their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, according to the American Psychological Association, there's a study that they did, and they found that an infant will cry on average about two and a quarter hours per day. Of course, as that infant grows and matures, it'll cut back its crying quite a bit, especially as it learns to just plain hide its tears or not cry at all. Although, we all know that even adults still cry. 
the same study showed that the average woman will cry emotional tears anywhere from 30 to 64 times per year. And the same study showed that the average man will cry emotional tears anywhere from 5 to 17 times per year. So statistically speaking, even though we only have two babies in this congregation, there are just over 100 members of Emmanuel who have cried in the last month. But maybe when we've done that crying, we did it in secret when no one was around. After all, many of us like to cry only when no one's looking, and if we happen to be around someone else, once those tears start forming in our eyes, a quick brush of the hand will quickly remove any evidence so that they don't know. That's sort of how we're conditioned as we grow up. You learn pretty quickly that sometimes crying in public can make other people uncomfortable. Or maybe you've been told that if you cry, it makes you weak. And so many of us cry only when no one else is around. But that's a lonely thing, isn't it? Crying all by yourself with no one there to empathize with you, no one there to offer you their shoulder to cry on, that is lonely. And if this is the case for you, maybe that even means that no one knows what you're going through. Maybe even those closest to you in your life have no idea that you've been crying lately, have no idea what you've been struggling with or what your fears are. If you feel like I could be describing you this morning, I've got good news for you. You've never been alone in any of these moments. There's an old song that I'm sure probably almost all of us are familiar with. It's an old song that goes like this. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. And while those words aren't found in the Bible, they do carry a thought from the Bible. Even if no one else knows about your troubles or your fears or your tears, God knows all about those things. And he keeps track of them, too. In our psalm today, King David, he wasn't king just yet, but he was anointed as king at this point. King David, he was all alone. He's crying out to God from the agony of his heart. He's surrounded by very real physical enemies. He is drowning in his tears. And yet the Lord is with him. And the Lord comforts him. If you felt alone or in sorrow lately, if you felt surrounded by enemies of all kinds, then you might be able to relate with David's words of the psalm, and my prayer is that you will find the same comfort that he found. The theme that we'll be considering this morning is, nobody knows but Jesus. He knows the torment of your enemies. He knows the torrent of your tears. Now, at the beginning of of many of the Psalms, we find a superscript. That's if, you, if you're looking in your Bible, there's like an italicized couple of lines at the beginning of a lot of the different Psalms. Usually it'll have like the author or maybe the tune that it's sung to. And most of the time when I copy and paste the Psalms into the bulletins, I'll just cut those portions out just for the sake of room on the page. But I included it here and I read it and you might have noticed that. And I'd like to read it again because it has some very important information for us. To the choir master, according to the dove on far-off terebinths. So that's the tune that the psalm is written to, which obviously we don't know what that tune is some three or 4,000 years later. But if you were around in David's time, I'm sure that you read the dove on far-off terebinths and immediately you know exactly what tune to sing it to. A miktam of David. So there our author is identified. It's King David the great king of Israel, the ancestor of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Then there's that other word, miktam, and usually I try to explain what those Hebrew words mean, and we actually don't know what that means, but it doesn't really matter because the very next phrase gives us all of the context clues that we need to truly understand this psalm. When the Philistines seized him in Gath. This is referring to a time period in King David's life that's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you remember from your Old Testament history, the people of Israel, they'd been ruled by the judges for quite some time. It was a direct relationship that they had with God. 
And then they requested a king from God, and God warned them that you're probably not going to like having a king over you that demands taxes and demands your kids go to war for him and demands some of your lands. But they wanted a king anyways, and so God sent Samuel the prophet to Saul to tell Saul and anoint Saul that he was going to be king. And at first it started out okay, but then Saul eventually departed from the Lord in all of his ways and in all of his ruling over the people. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, and so God decided another king was in store for the people. And so he sent Samuel to Bethlehem, to the fields behind a house where he met with Jesse and some of his sons, and each one Samuel would pass by and say, the Lord has not chosen this one until he ended up with the youngest just a little shepherd boy named David. And God said, this is the one that I have chosen to be my king. So Samuel anoints David. He becomes king, technically, although Saul still remained king for quite some time after this. Nevertheless, the Lord was with David, and David became a great and mighty warrior of the people. He started, if you probably recall, when he went to the battle lines, the Philistines were lined up there. They had their champion, Goliath, standing there. They were taunting the people of Israel, calling them to bring out their champion. And the only one who volunteered was this little boy, David. Just a youth with a sling and a few stones. And the Lord guided that rock right into Goliath's temple, right into Goliath's forehead, and Goliath fell and died. And that was just the beginning of David's reputation. Because after that, he continued to fight against the Philistines and all of their armies at every turn. He was a thorn in the, side, in the side of the Philistines, and he had become a folk hero for the people of Israel. In fact, we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 18 that David was so popular, so well-liked, that there was a song that the people would sing, which went like this. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Not King Saul's favorite song, as you can imagine. And because of the popularity of David and knowing that he posed a threat to his kingdom, he became bloodthirsty. And he would stop at nothing until he hunted David down and killed him. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, that's the situation that David finds himself in. In his homeland, he's not safe because his own king and the armies that are supposed to protect him and that he's fighting alongside of, they've turned against him. They're seeking him out. They want to kill him. And so David, as a man without a country, makes the quickest exit out of Israel that he can. And he winds up in the land of the only people who hate him as much as Saul does, the land of the Philistines. And when he enters into their land in Gath, we're told in the superscript, when he gets there, they know exactly who he is. Even in this age before social media or, or photography or print journalism, David's reputation preceded him so much that when they saw him, we're told in 1 Samuel 21, that they said, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands? Wherever he turned, he was surrounded by people who wanted him dead. And that is the context of our psalm and all of his words this morning. So we can understand what he's saying when he says, Man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. And then a few verses later, All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. He's literally surrounded by enemies and has absolutely nowhere to go. And in this hopeless situation, in faith, he turns to the one source of deliverance that he has. He turns to God in prayer. He prays in verse 3, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Perhaps the past number of months the enemies in your life have seemed to increase. I know there are members in our congregation that have been furloughed or, or have been out of work for, for whom the paycheck hasn't been coming in. And that doesn't mean that you have an enemy, per se, but it does sure feel sometimes like things are starting to stack against you when these things happen. Then we have the invisible enemy, the coronavirus, the very common enemy of all the people all around the world. Speaking about the world, here in America, we have enemies all around the world that do not like us for who we are, that do not like us for our faith either, and that pose real threats to us. 
But even in this country, as Christians, we know that we have enemies here too. Think of all the shots levied against the Christian faith. And even during the coronavirus pandemic, people saying, if there was a God, he's not as strong as this little virus. That's the most powerful thing in the world right now. So maybe we don't have the same type of enemies that David was facing. But we can certainly all relate to this idea. And so let's take a note from David here and follow in his footsteps. In the midst of these very real enemies and threats against his life, David proclaims, In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? David understood that even if King Saul found him and captured him and killed him, even if the Philistines captured him and paraded him through the streets and then crucified him in a victorious parade, David knew that even if those things happened, that was really just a small thing. It's just as later when Jesus would tell his disciples, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill a body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. COVID-19, loss of income, unemployment, unbelieving antagonists. These are all the things that can't really touch you. Yes, they can harm you in some temporary way, but even if they do their worst and take, their, take your life from you, they really haven't taken much from a believer in Christ Jesus. Because after death, our life, it's in the hands of God. And we know anyways that, that all of these things that really stress us out, these aren't really our enemies. Our enemies, our, our enemy is the devil who uses those things against us. That's what the Apostle Paul says when he writes, uh, he writes to the Ephesians, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our real enemies are the devil and our sin and our sinful flesh. And Jesus knows all about these enemies. And he's taking care of them too. Jesus wrestled against these, your biggest enemies. He wrestled against the devil. He wrestled against temptation himself. And he wrestled against the weight of your sins as he carried it to the cross on his shoulders. And he triumphed over all of them. He triumphed over them all victoriously on the cross. And now even your worst enemies have become a footstool for his feet, Psalm 110 tells us. And so we can cry out with Paul, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. And this isn't some nebulous God that we're putting our trust in. This isn't just some, some far off, out of the way, vague source or sense of, of hope that we kind of have. And so we put some sort of trust in him, hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. That's not it at all. We put our trust in God, who reveals himself to us as the one who knows our enemies and has already accounted for them, has already taken care of, care of them, and has overpowered them. He is the one who, according to Paul, has disarmed all powers and authorities, has made a public spectacle of them by triumphing over them in the cross. He was the victor. And on the victor's side, God declares that you are now in his hand. As Jesus says, I give to you eternal life, and you will never perish. And no one can snatch you out of my hand. My Father who has given you to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch you out of my Father's hand. You may feel like you have a whole host of enemies lurking at your gates, and Jesus knows all about them. He's already taken care of them, and there's really nothing that they can do to you. But even knowing this, there may still be those times when everything just seems so stacked against us. There may still be those times when we feel so stressed out over our enemies that all we can really do is cry. That's what David did here in our text. 
He says he's, he's surrounded by enemies on multiple fronts. He puts his trust in God. But these things still kept him lying awake at night. But then he gives this wonderful confession of the grace of God as shown to him. He says, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Wherever you are at, tonight or tomorrow, we know that the very hairs of your head are numbered. That's what God tells us. Not only does God count your hairs wherever you are at, if you are losing sleep, God keeps track of those hours as well. The hours spent staring at the ceiling when it feels like your life is falling apart around you, those times when it feels hard to believe that God is really present because you don't have any semblance of a calm or restful sleep, even in those hours, God promises to be right there with you. Just as not a sparrow falls to the ground without God knowing it, there's not a minute where you lie tossing and turning in bed at night of which God is not aware. And then David asks that his tears be put into God's bottle so that God could hold them and keep track of every single one of them. And so God does. He knows the torrent of your tears. Your sorrows are not your sorrows alone. They are those things that God has claimed and that has been taken up into Christ Jesus your Savior. He's counted and kept track of every last tear. Not a single one is shed in vain. God's accounted for these things, and he's already made a plan to get rid of them. In Revelation 21, he tells us, He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Heaven will finally be that place where we have no more fears, no more anxieties, no more enemies, no more tears, no more sleepless nights. And it's with the knowledge of this Eternal deliverance. It's with the knowledge of, of the ultimate deliverance through Jesus Christ, whom David knew was going to be coming from his family line. His confidence lying in this ultimate deliverance. That's what led David to say, My enemies will turn back on the day in which I call. This I know, that God is for me. Now you might be thinking, easy for you to say, David. God is for you, obviously. And we saw that throughout David's life, back when he was just a shepherd boy and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, gi the giant Goliath and swung his sling and killed the giant. Obviously, God was with him there. David also tells us elsewhere that when he was even younger than that, there had been a lion in the field and he was shepherding the sheep. And with his own hands, he killed that lion. Clearly, God was with him there. We know that God sent Samuel to David and said, you have been the one that I hand-selected to be my king and to be the ancestor of the Savior, my own son. Clearly, God was for him. Anyone who was paying attention knew that. Can we say the same? Can we, together with David, say, God is for me? We can. And we absolutely should. Notice in the last verse of our text, David praises God because he confesses, You have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. In what situation is David writing those words? He's still in Philistia, still surrounded by his sworn enemies. King Saul and the armies of Israel are still after him, still bloodthirsty, trying to find him and have his head and raise it on a stake. They are still trying to kill him. And yet in that moment, David says, you have delivered my soul from death. He hadn't been delivered from anything yet. But he knew that God was his deliverer. He knew that God would rescue him, and so he speaks about this future deliverance as if it had already happened in the past. And so can you speak about your rescue in Christ Jesus, something that will ultimately happen on Judgment Day, but something that has already happened for each of you. And so right now you can speak about your deliverance from sin and death as an already accomplished fact in the past tense. 
because God has already delivered us into his kingdom. Even if the enemies of our flesh do the very worst thing that they can do and take our lives from us, they've really taken nothing from us. For then our lives are in God's hand, and then we know that we've been delivered from sin and death through Jesus Christ. The full and free forgiveness which he won for us on the cross, it delivered us from the chains of sin and the bonds of death and delivered us to the light of life. So there's nothing to fear. And that means that you can also say, God is for me. David could say that only because God very clearly spoke and said the words that, David, you're going to be the king. I have chosen you. God's chosen you, too. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul tells us that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He called you and made you his own children. He spoke very clearly at your baptisms, saying that you were now his child and that you were heirs of heaven. And when God speaks, he doesn't go back on his word. You can go home today, and if you know where your baptismal certificate is, you can pull it out and point to it and say, this is the proof that God is for me, because he declared it. Yes, that baptism, the Bible tells us, it's as if it transports us back to the cross of Calvary, that lonely hill outside of Jerusalem where Jesus hung by himself for your sins and mine. And in this very special way, Jesus announced, yes, I am for you. So keep these things on your hearts and on your minds as you're tormented by enemies of this world, as you lie sleeplessly awake at night, as you drown your face in a torrent of tears. Remember that when you're afraid, you can put your trust in God. What can flesh do to you anyways? God is for you. He has delivered you from the hands of death and the clutches of Satan. He's removed your guilt forever. Maybe there are times when you could sing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. But you can always continue that song and then sing, nobody knows, but Jesus. He does know. He's kept track of all of these things. He's made plans for them, and he's already delivered you from them. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. be seated for the next hymn, hymn 784, and you can find that printed in your bulletin.
Almighty and everlasting God, who searches all hearts, knows all thoughts, and who sees all things, both evil and good, grant us, as we approach the throne of your grace, true humility and sorrow over our sins. We ask you, Lord, do not remember the sins of our youth or our many transgressions, but according to your tender mercy, pardon our iniquity on account of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. Graciously give to us a true understanding of your word, so that we may be guided in every facet of our lives, and that we may clearly see the path to everlasting life. Keep before us the warning and encouragement of the Holy Scriptures. Enable us to learn, by the examples we find in the Bible, what things you would have us do. Help us to keep your commandments with joy, so that we may do the work you have given us to do, while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. Dear Father, glorify your name in all the earth, and send forth willing workers to proclaim the gospel of reconciliation with wisdom, love, and boldness, so that great numbers out of every nation shall trust alone in Christ and be saved. Keep our country and people within your care, that, on, that honor and honesty, truth and integrity may be upheld, and that all lawlessness, wickedness, and rebellion may be put down. In particular, we pray for our elected officials and all who bear responsibility for our government, that they may be endowed with wisdom that is in accord with your will. Guard and defend our homes, that parents may be kept in the bonds of love and godliness and may raise their children well, nourishing them in truth and righteousness. We pray for all who may be ill in body or mind, for all who may be in danger of body or soul, for all who may be in distress and confusion, and especially for those who suffer persecution because of their Christian faith. Lord, be present with them in their affliction and show them the comfort of your presence and grant them relief according to your good and gracious will. Heavenly Father, who did not spare your own precious Son, but gave him up for us all, according to your mercy, grant these and all other needs that you see in our hearts. We ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Changing. 